all of you are involved in storytelling for people like those who are here in this audience. Uh, and I don't, think, I, I don't think anybody could deny that we're in a new world of storytelling. There once was a time when each one of you with representing an organization or with an idea could pick up the phone and call a news editor at a local publication or a national publication or an international one, plant the seed of a story, and hope that they would do the story and the story would get out there. It would be published in, let's say, the International Herald Tribune or something like that, and you would count that as a big score. That would be a really big deal, a success story. Today, uh, mo many people have never even heard of the International Herald Tribune. Uh, many people, even in the United States, no longer read or pay attention to the kinds of media that used to be the, the objects of big scores like that in terms of storytelling. And today, storytelling is done very differently, and you are all doing it differently. <laughs> so I'd like to ask each of you first, what is it that you are doing, what techniques are you using today that very likely would not have been used as recently as five or even ten years ago What's new in the arena of storytelling? And if you, I mean, I'll follow up on this, but if you have an example of something that you thought would work, because what a great idea this is, but it didn't work, why didn't it work? Was it because of the change of technology? Was it because of the attention span of the public? Uh, was it because of the nature of the story you're trying to tell? And so on. Uh, so that, that's where I want to start is, Tell, give me an example, if you can, of something that you've done that has plumbed new ground, that has been forced by the change in the media environment, has forced by the change in the consumption of stories by users and by the demands and the needs of the organizations that you're engaged in. Who wants to start with that? Shamil, you want to start? Sure. Um, first, I should start with the caveat that I'm not a media professional, uh, and that's not false humility. I'm really not a media professional. Uh, we have... Um, uh, teams on the ground in our organization search for common ground in some of these very violent conflict zones in, in Yemen and Syria and Central African Republic all over the world. Um, and for us, the power of storytelling and the use of different media to tell stories uh, really became explicitly clear in 1994 around the Rwandan genocide. Um, the uh, leadership of Radio Mil Colin, uh, um, that was largely responsible for fomenting genocide in Rwanda, uh, I think was the first media outlet and the first media professionals to be convicted uh, of crimes against humanity by the War Crimes Tribunal. And so the first point I think that really becomes important to us, even before we get to how has the media landscape changed, is this core question of how powerful our stories are not. Can stories save lives? 1994 and the Rwandan genocide, and, and I would say many conflicts before that, demonstrated that uh, effective storytelling can certainly uh, lose, kill lives, for, for, uh, lead people to, to take lives. Uh, on a grand scale. And when we began looking then uh, immediately on the heels of the genocide in Burundi for what could be done, it was the Burundian journalists and others that we began talking to who said, you know what, the same way that you can use media to turn people against one another and build up the fear of one another, you can use the same tools to actually bring people together in really effective ways and to inoculate the masses against those who would manipulate their fears to turn them against one another. So that for us was an awakening and that was the first time we uh, worked with this local team, initially five very courageous journalists working out of a basement to develop radio programming. Um, they were later credited by the Under Secretary of State for African Affairs in the US, the highest uh, American official in, uh, Af uh, in Africa, with having helped to prevent genocide in Burundi because of the effectiveness of what they did. And what they did included journalism. They, were, they started the first multi-ethnic Hutu Tutsi radio studio in the Great Lakes region of Africa. But some of the most powerful programming they did had nothing to do with news. Um, they ran for 12 years, we worked with that team uh, to produce the most popular radio program in Burundi by far. Uh, I'm not even going to try the Kurundi name, it was called Our Neighbors Ourselves. And it was the stories, it was the dramatic radio serial story of, of uh, Hutu and Tutsi neighbors who lived side by side. The conflicts that they would come into on a day-to-day -day basis, the interethnic romances, the tensions, everything that would come up and how they would navigate these things. That show had over 90% listenership, which you could never get in a saturated media market, but you could get in those days in a place like Burundi. That model of storytelling for us then evolved into today where we don't do just media anywhere. 
but we try to use media everywhere. And the media that we try to use is whatever medium is the most powerful and has the broadest reach, uh, whether that is literally community theater in rural districts, radio oftentimes, as it was told elsewhere, uh, television. We produce hundreds of hours of soap opera programming and reality television. Reality television is an excellent format for uh, social change media because uh, the formats can really be developed in a way that engage communities in taking action directly, uh, not just broadcasting. And so I guess the one, you know, we can get to your question around where we've made mistakes or we thought something uh, would make a difference that didn't. Um, but I think that what's important to first understand is that storytelling is really not a question of simply the soft side. Uh, there was an article just this week in the Wall Street Journal, which is just the latest of a number of things that have come out uh, over in recent years, really demonstrating that people's behavior and actions are almost entirely driven and based on emotional experience. We like to think that they're based on rational thought. They are not. Deepak Chopra said it just before this panel. Facts don't influence behavior. Doesn't mean that facts don't matter, especially in today's world. But we've seen again and again that if you take two people who believe opposite things and you give them the same fact, it's extraordinary how quickly they will interpret that very same fact to reinforce their pre-existing opposing worldviews. And so storytelling, which accesses emotions, which moves people at the heart, which accesses their aspirations. Storytelling can really move masses. And storytelling is about taking facts and telling, making a story about them, not just spilling out facts. It, a, a, right? Story, right. a story without facts is a fairy tale, I think. Okay. Um, and fairy tales are great. I've got little kids, I tell fairy tales all the time. But I think when we think about the challenge we're all facing in the world today, um, fundamentally, we need to tell stories based on facts. And the, and the greatest storytellers who do that every day are journalists. Um, so I think just to your original question, I was sort of racing through my head, what is the latest technology we're using at DevX? That I, it's really not uh, that we're doing something so novel, we're actually kind of going back to the old ways. It's traditional shoe leather journalism. I mean, that's really what's required. And I think the, the news business is undergoing a massive business model change, right? A huge disruption, but fundamentally what's still required is someone like Lindsay, who we saw this morning with the photographs, willing to go to places, put her own life in, in some risk, and bring her skills to the table and tell stories based on something real. And so, somebody willing to pay her to do that. People right, and getting that business model. Right. right. Yeah. Absolutely. That. So the thing we're doing today that I think is it's a little bit new for us, or maybe it's surprising to people, is we're hiring foreign correspondents. And we're hiring people in countries around the world where we think there's important stories to tell. And uh, we're hiring journalists from a lot of the publications you mentioned. Those publications have maybe closed down their foreign bureaus. We're, we're taking that opportunity to find great talent and, and ensure we've got a reporter on the ground in different parts of the world where there's important stories to be told. Laura, do you want to comment on this question of are you doing something uh, today that would not have been done, that you did not do when you were working for ABC? Or? Yes. I don't know where to start. I, I want to say, <laughs> okay, we'll I say something from here, okay. which I would have never shared publicly, but feel like this is an appropriate forum for it. You did it out of love. You did it out of love. You, you pitched that story to ABC out of love. Something drew you to that story, to that per That one can't be left behind. What their experience says something we need to pay attention to. And as media, as we know it, has morphed into an unhealthy place, which we won't, just not what this panel is about, the news hole, what we call the news hole, but the minutes, the column inches for that person have sh collapsed. And so I loved my old job. I, people were shocked that I left it. I did it out of love. I'm a deeply faithful person. I'm a Christian who loves Islam, who's been coached by Judaism and Hinduism. I, I loved the people in Syria too much to let them fall off the radar. And that's vital. I mean, so when I, I did that because the format, in its best iteration, doesn't have space for that anymore. There's only so much, I call it sometimes fetish or famine. There's a fetishizing of the Arab Spring, the, fe the window for that fetish closed before Bahrain and Yemen were even done getting on. Syria came last, it needed a format. I was digital enough that it said in my remit to know that you have an environment where that problem needs a solution. You have infinite technological opportunities to solve it. You have micro communities and micro audiences looking for that information. And so you do it out of love. You find the solution. You use what you can to 
technology is currently always updating, the uh, contexts are shifting, the formats are almost irrelevant because they're almost like the recipe that you need for, to serve a certain meal in a certain place to certain people. Let me follow up on that concept of micro communities and micro audiences because you've all touched on that mm -hmm. in one way or another. Uh, have we become a media environment and a storytelling environment in which the goal is no longer the mass audience, let's reach as many people as we possibly can meet, mm -hmm. reach on the Syria story or the water story or the, or the Burundi story, uh, the Rwanda story. But instead, let's reach the people who are thirsty for this story, the people who crave the deep level of information. And if it's only a few people, and I mean relatively speaking, only a few people? Yes. Comment so this is what we wrote about in our fellowship at Columbia, was the rise of single subject journalism, which builds on that. But more to your point, I think what, whether it's fake news looking to influence elections or a directed effort for development professionals, where, which audience, which of the many publics gives you the leverage you need, whether it's in country context. So one word on that in terms of the methodology we've developed that every issue has, its com is, has a multi-stakeholder community. And so we've learned over time how we've, we break down to five segments for everyone's interest so they can use it in their own context. The policy sector, the private sector, what we call the knowledge sector, those who are research or university practitioners or frontline researchers, the social sector, philanthropies and NGOs, and the engaged public, that subset of the broader public that is gonna make the most noise, that is gonna be involved. And from there, you, it's actually very virtuous. You, when you serve a specific community, like Raj does, like Shamil does, you, you have to keep it high bar. That's the only thing they want. And then you can offer it up to everybody else. Everyone, we call it being a vitamin supplement for the news industry. You have to produce for that target, and then what you produce can be shared more widely. Talk about the micro-community angle from your perspective. You're out hiring foreign correspondents to go yeah. cover stories, but you're, the audience for their stories you won't get them anymore in the mass media, very likely. Yeah, I think the media environment has just changed so much, so you never know. Um, you know, in the old days, you might have had a platform, a television network, and said, we know at 7.30 p.m., 10 million people tune to that channel. Now it's more about the quality of the content. So one individual reporter, they don't even have to be part of a publication. If they go out and break an amazing story, that story can get picked up by other media, by social media, and can reach far more than 10 million people. So I think it's really more about going back to the core of you know, not, getting, not getting stuck in, in an idea that it was great before, that media was sort of perfect and we had, when we had mass media, we had a three big channels. I actually think we're in a golden era of media in some ways. We have a, a really big challenge, which is a societal challenge. I think it's, it's to your point, it's people hearing the same fact and programming it in their minds in a different way. That's a different issue necessarily than a media issue. So the, the kind of thing we try to do at DevX, where our audience are people like a lot of people in this room, people who work in, in the humanitarian sector, in the development sector, in the global health sector, if we can tell a story that's credible enough that a global health professional reads and says, I learned something, this is real, then that influences journalists and editors at other publications who might then pick up that story and take it with them, and it grows and takes on a life of its own. So we can ultimately have that influence, but we have to earn it. We have to earn it with that great story to begin with. We've got to, we've got to find something that's unique and, and drill down and send that reporter on the ground to really talk to people and find out what's going on. And we can't just rely on the idea that, well, we've got, we've got the audience already. It's there, so we can give them whatever we want. So I, I think there are some real challenges in this moment that we're in, everyone targeting their own audience. I, I get that. But I think the bigger challenge is, is this meta story that's societal, which is this us versus them mentality and Deepak Chopra talked quite a bit about this. And that's kind of one meta story versus the other, which is we're all in it together. I think as long as you're in your own micro community telling the we're all in it together story, connecting why these issues do matter to every person, whatever country you live in, whatever, whatever your circumstances are, you're contributing to bringing us all together. If you're using the platform you've got, which is what we see now, uh, and I look at lots of media that's come out now that's very prominent. You know, Breitbart is in the clips in, in the executive uh, you know, federal agencies now. When you get your clips every day of the news and you work in a federal agency, you'll, you'll see Breitbart articles, right? So those kinds of publications, they're not, they might be trying to reach a mass audience, but that's not the solution, right? Their, their challenge is they're living in the us versus them construct. 
And so whatever our micro community is, as long as we're rejecting that and focusing on we're all in it together, writing a story about Rohingya refugees and explaining how that matters to every person on the planet, then we're part of the right trend, I think, in media. Yeah, I, you know, the, the subject of today's, this whole gathering is bridging our divides, okay? And you're, you're now talking about, you know, niche media that, that doesn't bridge the divides, but just, you know, is, uh, speaks to the, the narratives of one sector or other sector. Um, I, I, you know, I'm very grateful to the Hilton Foundation for making this the subject and frankly inviting me here uh, to address these very inspiring change makers. Uh, conflict handled poorly is the primary source of suffering and violence uh, today. Um, conflict is also, as Mayor Garcetti indicated earlier, handled well, is at the source of every great breakthrough in human development. When different cultures come into contact with one, the conflict is the natural friction that comes about from difference. And you handle it well, it's the source of every, most of the great developments in humankind's history. You handle it poorly, at the very least you have polarization, we have plenty of that around the world, and at the worst you have violence, which brings all other humanitarian and development uh, indicators down to zero, sometimes for a generation or more. And I, I think recognizing that then takes me to the place of, well, how do you use media and storytelling to deal with that reality? For us, I'm going to stick up for fairy tales in, for a second, because we do, it is true, we use facts through storytelling. In the camps in South Sudan, where we, we've done thousands of hours of community theater, um, those stories are sourced from people in the camps telling about the abuses and the things that have happened to them, and then our acting troops putting those into dramatic format in a way that can open up constructive conversations that if you invited them to a meeting about what's going on in the camp would never happen. Mm -hmm. That's taking facts, integrating them into narrative storytelling and using that as a way to open up discussions that can prevent further violence uh, and conflict. That's one way that you can do it. But, uh, but you, you, um, there's something that we have to indicate. Let me put myself, an earlier panel was talking about female genital cutting and one of the panelists, uh, Maria, I think it was, talked about the fact that when, when her group started talking to the men, they found that some of the men were deeply conflicted, uh, uncomfortable, but couldn't break out of it. Social norms, uh, you, can, if you can really influence social norms through storytelling. Because for many people, social norms, what the media does, it, it reflects to people what they think society will expect and accept. And that helps to really reinforce social norms. And if you develop storytelling in a way that might be a little bit a little bit out front of where society is um, that's not just based on facts but helps paint a picture for how social norms could be a little bit different. You can open up discussions across these dividing lines. So to me, the power of storytelling is really in the kind of storytelling that brings people together across these divides to deal with the number one problem we have in the world today, which is violent conflict. And I'll end with this. You know, we, in case you doubt this question about violent conflict, 10 years ago, 80% of humanitarian aid was going to victims of natural disasters. Today, 80% of humanitarian aid is going to people whose lives have been turned upside down by violent conflict. The unprecedented refugee crisis we have today is almost entirely sparked by violent conflict. We're dealing with the prospect of four simultaneous famines for the first time in human history, every one of which has been primarily caused by or greatly exacerbated by violent conflict. So when we come back to this question of how do you bridge your divides, storytelling has to be done in a way, for us anyway, it has to be done in a way that does not just speak to the outrages of one side against the other, even if it's the good side as we might see it. It has to be done in a way that can bring people together across their dividing lines and break through this otherness and help people to craft a future that's better for everyone. Laura, Two are, pieces yeah. of good news from the trenches of, of operating these models. One is that when you get thematic and focused along a specific issue, which is really barreling down the answer to a question, what to do with Sy about Syria, how to handle the California drought. We did water deeply, focused on California water. When you're that thematically focused, people tend to be more pragmatic than partisan. We have found that when we do that, not only do we get picked up by everyone from Huffington Post to Breitbart, but that the conversations, you cannot tell who is what on the political spectrum. There are controversies, there are, whether it's fast track asylum laws in Italy or what to do about water infrastructure in California, but it's, it's not across partisan lines. And the second piece of good news is this same broken news environment is self-aware enough to know that it's broken and is very open to taking the byproduct of things that Raj and I, and I, I'm sure also Shamil, but I don't know as, as intimately, we did a series of diaries 
from Syria. A 15-year-old girl, when the war started, started writing for us every, every several weeks. And it was co-published by Rookie Magazine, which reaches millions of teenage girls in the United States. They're the ones who asked us to do it. Rookie asked us to, she told us stories of her, not only of running out of food in her community, and they made, started making cakes out of cow meal, uh, and they couldn't, it was a disaster. Getting marriage proposals from her father's friends who were three times her age, and our whole audience of teenage girls saying, don't do it, Mara, don't do it. It's like, they, it, they, they take it in now in a new way. And that, what ProPublica does, it is tremendous. That impact is tremendous. And it, it has created an ecosystem in which the start of the chain is often smaller newsrooms, independent newsrooms, and then it has a, a grand impact. I want to be sure to, to touch on something in this group, in this panel, that is going to be of special interest, I think, to the people in this audience. On this panel, I think it's fair to say, but you guys correct me if I'm wrong, I think we have two uh, basic frameworks. I'd say Raj and Lara are what I would say speaking to the choir. Your audiences are people who are already involved, already engaged, already asking for information on these topics. Shamil and his organization are targeting the people you work with in the field, as you discussed a minute ago in Sudan, but uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, and those are two different models of storytelling. They can use the same kinds of techniques. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. Let me ask Raj and Lara first. Talk about, is there a divide that needs to be bridged within or among humanitarian organizations uh, who you know are interested in the topics, but they don't go beyond maybe their predefined notion of what this topic is or something like that? And how are you addressing that? And then, Shamil, I'm going to come back to you to ask about, you know, you're not addressing so much the humanitarian organizations, but you can help them address their audiences in, in their communities. Raj, yeah, I, I think the pitfall for our community is we tend to like to say we're doing a great job. <laughs> uh, we like to focus on good intentions. So we like to say, you know, we found an issue. It's a really serious issue. We're working on it. And so there are glossy brochures that lots of organizations put out. If you look at the website of a not-for-profit or a foundation, it's usually all the good news stories. So the thing that's a bit unique about DevX coming into the scene where there wasn't a lot of journalistic coverage of global development of humanitarian work is that, sure, we want to highlight the things that are working, but the only way that's credible is if you also highlight things that are not working. And it's been interesting to watch the reaction in our community as people have read stories sometimes about their own organization and saying, oh, we, we failed at something. But I think this is an important moment for the health, development, humanitarian community to really get out in front and, and say honestly to the, to the world, it's not just about good intentions and we're willing to highlight our own failures. We're willing to say when that grant was not a smart grant or that, that initiative failed. And unless we're willing to say that, we'll never get past this divide that we see where there are some people who say, just care about your own people. Forget about the rest of the world. Uh, and, and then there are others who say, no, you've got to just care about the rest of the world. If we can be honest and show what's not working, honest with ourselves, really, and tell the truth a bit more publicly, I think that's going to help bridge the divide that we're dealing with. Um, among other things, it will also help those very same organizations say, oh, here is the problem we need to fix. Let's assign somebody or some people or find some ideas to fix that problem. If they're not reported on, it, it and, gets and if swept it just, the And rug. if it just feels like, like communications, if it just feels like, you know, there they are again saying that there's another famine or another crisis, right? So if you're the average voter uh, in the UK, for example, you might say, Okay, but these are other people's problems. What about my own problems? I have my own problems in my own country. And I think one of the ways we start to break through that as a humanitarian community is to be honest with people about things, for example, like the migration crisis and say, it's not just bad, it's likely to get far worse. This is likely just the very beginning. The conflicts you talked about in partly are being driven by climate change. And it's, it's likely, given the massive population growth in the poorest countries in the world, we're going to have a billion, 1.3 billion people, according to the UN, in the poorest countries in the world in the next 25 years or so, 30 years or so. Uh, that population growth, if we don't change the dynamic urgently, the way Deepak Chopra, I think, rightly called us out to do, uh, is likely to lead to more challenges at a much greater scale than anything we're experiencing today. Uh, but we don't necessarily tell that story in that way to the public or even to ourselves. 
And I think that hurts us. That lack of honesty hurts our own community. And Laura, does digging deeply on siloed topics help solve that problem? Oh my gosh. We see, we've seen it achieve a lot, honestly. I'm not saying that in, room, in front of a room of people. We, our, our, one of our founding insights was that the community of practice, that not just the converted in the, in, in the choir, okay. but anyone working, just, not, just, in terms of the, the people working on this, an issue are often unaware of each other's actions, interested in each other's findings, mm -hmm including FGM, they, they want to know what's going on in the state of the issue. So some of it, we, we're very geeky. Within the, <laughs> when we cover a community of practice, we need to produce journalism that's self-referential, shows people what their peers are doing. Some of it paradigm shifting. Are we getting this right? Where did the money go in Greece? How are people living relative to where the money went in Greece? Um, and then some of it investigative. We're on, in California, 200,000 people in this state cannot drink what comes out of the tap. 1.5 million by a larger estimate, but if you want to be completely hardcore, and, and they guess where they live, in the poorest communities, farming communities, unincorporated communities, and you know, it's, it's so the, the, those who think about water, those who think, they need to be thinking about them, and if they don't see them, they won't think about them. So that information makes it easier to do their jobs the way they need to be done in order for the situation to be resolved, and then it helps bring on board other people to the issue because they have a place where they can read up. That, that, that is in the public record now. It cannot be missed. Does it help organizations that work on water issues someplace else, 100%. far away, to realize, oh, wait a minute, we've already solved that problem well, or that piece of the problem? Mindfully so. Mindfully so. I mean, I don't think when everyone was talking about Flint, Michigan, people weren't thinking about the San Joaquin Valley here, but they were experiencing the same thing. And so the ability to spot patterns, I, I say this with love and affection, storytelling is also data collection. It's the lived experience of the current policies and current interventions and how they're working out. And so the inability to see what's going on within the scope of a question, whether it's how will everyone in this country get to drink what comes out of the tap, requires that level of diligence. You used to get it in newsrooms. We picked up, I don't want to name names, we picked up a lot of reporters who were fired by mainstream publications in California who had covered water for decades. I mean, this can't be expertise. missed. Can't be, and then it, it applies in Israel. It applies in the Gulf. It applies play other places that are water scarce environments, looking at very similar things and similar solutions. And if you have to have that connective tissue, so we've paired that publishing with very active community management. Every topic we cover has a database of people working on that issue, who then participate in input. About fifty percent of the content on the site comes from what they say about what they're doing. It's just journalism by a different format. Raj, briefly. Just a quick vignette. So you mentioned that we started as a student project at the Kennedy School. And uh, I was, as a grad student, asking people, so if I want to see a list of all the organizations, let's say working on violent conflict or working on uh, maternal health or what have you, where do I find that list? Or if I just want to know, you know, who's hiring in this field or where's the funding coming from? And the advice I got from just about everybody was, go to Washington, D.C. and go to cocktail parties. This, this is how the development sector works. This is how humanitarians operate. You just got to get to know each other. And, and I was just shocked. And it seemed like an obvious fit for media. And yet, even to this day, we've been around 17 years now, very often we will attend what we think is a really important event, maybe you know, about uh, one of the issues we're talking about today, and we'll be the only journalist in the room, even today. Shamil, you started out at the beginning of the session talking about storytelling saving lives. I want to ask you first, and then everybody, and we only have a few minutes left, um, about the question of doing that in an environment where it is now possible for me to hear your story and say, ah, that's fake news, and just declare it, unilaterally declare that what you're doing is wrong, and then people who listen to me say, oh, oh, well, I'm not going to read Shamil's stories before, go to his theater performance or whatever. How do you deal in the field where you work with maybe the leaders or the opposition party or the, I'm making this up so you need to fill right. it in, with the people who say, ah, don't go to that performance, that's fake news. Right. Uh, it helps a lot when you're developing stories uh, uh, with script writers, acting troops, and producers who themselves cut across the dividing lines in the community, whether that's here in the United States or it's in Democratic Republic of Congo or anywhere else. That's the first thing. Um, because then, I'll tell you that one of the most popular programs we have going right now is a, is a television drama in the DRC about Ilombe, a fictitious police officer who is trying to do the right thing in a context where there's corruption around him in the police force, 
where he hasn't been paid in three months, where the community has really unrealistic expectations of what he and the rest of the police can do. Most of the things that we're dealing with that get translated as very black and white issues, from female genital cutting to police brutality to pretty much anything, uh, are not nearly as black and white when you actually engage communities. And so when the stories are being developed and told by people who are stuck in the system, and they are together trying to craft a story about how it could be different, uh, it has a, mo a lot more resonance. And the last thing I would say is, again, we don't do just media anywhere because we find that media goes broad but not deep. So everywhere where, the, where we're working, if we're doing a soap opera program like that, we are doing thousands of hours of community outreach, dialogue groups, soccer tournaments that lead to discussions between the police and the youth that are fighting them in the streets. And that's really key. I think today, the source has become much more the question of credibility for people than the content. And so if you send me something on Facebook and we're friends and I know you, I'm gonna trust that. CNN, New York Times, I don't know. And so uh, it becomes really important that you're developing these stories with people who cut across the different uh, nodes of credibility of sources. And, and that takes time. That's why we don't make any short-term com commitments anywhere we work, but it is truly transformative because, and I'll end with this, there are really two ways to drive social change. Adversarial, where you're gonna pick the side that you agree with, identify your adversaries and go to war with them, whether they're the Republicans and Democrats here, and a lot of what you do in that point is to delegitimize the other side. And the kinds of victories that are won there are increasingly being understood as Pyrrhic victories. They're empty, they just sow the seeds of future conflict, and we're seeing this everywhere in the world, I would say. The other approach to social change is what I would call a collaborative or inclusive approach to social change, where you take the issue and then you find everyone who's affected by that issue, whether you think these are the victims and these are the, the, the victimizers or whatever, and you find a way to bring them together around that issue and to develop a different, help work with them to develop a different kind of future. And storytelling is one of the most effective ways for them to paint that picture for the rest of communities. Let me just ask all three of you really briefly. Uh, do your audiences all get their stories from Facebook friends, or are your audiences doing something different in terms of finding out about whatever it is you're, you're writing about? Is the, is the friend recommendation that Shamil just mentioned the powerful influencing force among your audiences? Is it? We're very rare in that sense. We have a strong direct relationship with our readers, so most of it is direct they're trusting traffic, your and they're coming sources. through our newsletters. And through, but the, um, everything he said, to the to your question yeah. and also um, very being extremely fair and not prone to exaggeration there was a moment in serious conflict where it was clear to us that everyone in the world was calling anyone with a gun a rebel if you are government you're a rebel it's like these rebels are a different flavor than those rebels this is very as usual, things are ISIS. more complicated. Well, just the nuance and then not allowing for just a lot of evil, what we call evil regime pieces either. But that ends up giving you credibility with a round spread of folks. How about uh, among, on DevEx? Are people, yeah. are you finding that people trust DevEx for its credibility and are not getting their recommendations from friends? On I, I think the brand really matters. And I think, you know, the New York Times, for example, their stock has doubled since the presidential election as much as they've been called the failing New York Times and the fake news New York Times. You know, Maybe because. Yeah, and, and I, I think you're, you're right that the that friends and you know, new, new social media platforms mean that it's easier for people to connect with their friend and maybe learn you know, what they think is credible from their friend. But I don't think we should back away from the idea of building credible media brands that can be trusted, that have a mission and have an ethos and say, this is what we're about and put it out there very plainly. Um, if there's anything we learn from this election and all the fake news sites that are out there, we need to get consumers of news to be more savvy and to know that just because it sounds like a real news organization, it's got Gazette or Herald or something in it, doesn't mean it's a legitimate news organization. And we, those of us who have media brands need to take it very seriously, our, our mission. When we make mistakes, we need to make corrections. Uh, we need to own up to them and we need to employ real journalists and kind of go back to the tradition, just to kind of go back to where I started, to go back to what it means to be a journalist, which is a construct in the way Deepak Chopra reminded us, but it's one that really matters that we have to preserve. The New York Times is flourishing now as what many see as the newspaper of the resistance, and that's very dangerous for the middle ground of the United States. We have to be careful for that as well. I, you know, as I'm sure you can imagine, this topic is, is something I could spend all day talking about, but I'm afraid we don't have uh, any more time than that. So I'd like to thank our panelists, Laura Satrakian, Raj Kumar, and Samuel Rajas, please.